and no. Okay, so um, today marks a point of transition um, within the class. It won't be the last uh, for this class. In another uh, another lecture, we'll actually have another point of transition. Um, but um, today marks uh, the first time we're going to go on to subsequently discuss the third major type of modeling explored in this class. This too is a type of dynamic modeling, modeling of situations where we have some simulation mimicking aspects of the world in terms of behavior over time from a system where the, the state of that system is evolving over time, changing over time, and where the behavior seen depends on that state kind of the definition of a, of a dynamic system. The behavior at any one time depends on the state. With system dynamics models, the rates of change that were observed, how quickly the number of infectives was rising or how quickly the number of susceptibles was falling or the number of people per day that were waning immunity that depended on the model state. It depended on the number of people who were in the susceptible state, the infected state, the recovered state, et cetera. Model behavior, just like behavior of systems in the world, depends on the state of the system. If there's nobody in hospital as a patient, there's gonna be nobody discharged in the next day. And in system dynamics, it was the rates of change that were, the aspects of behavior of change that depended on state. With agent-based modeling, we had a broader language for describing states. We had state charts, but we also had variables. We have mechanisms that serve to, to trigger events periodically to undertake actions. And as we'll see, we can even, even do things like embed stocks and flows in these sort of models. But once again, the, what was occurring, the behavior over time, the change that was happening at any one time depended on the model state. If a person wasn't in a susceptible state, you could send them all the messages you want to infect them, it's not gonna get them infected. They're only gonna get infected from a susceptible state. They're only going to recover from an infected state, for example, or lose immunity from a, a recovered state. They're only going to be sending messages to other agents, say, for exposure from an infective state. So, what behavior the model exhibits, what's going on over time, the change in the model over time depends on the state of the model, just like in system dynamics. System dynamics, it it affected the rates of change of these variables, how quickly they're going up and down. In agent-based modeling, it affected a broader set of things, including change of states by agents, sending of messages, triggering of events, and a lot of other things. But once again, what change was going on was dependent on system state. And now we're going in to the third type of modeling, discrete event simulation. And discrete event simulation also is a form of dynamic modeling. Now, as such, the behavior that's observed, the change that is observed depends on the model state. Someone's chance of getting served by a physician in the next minute depends how many people are ahead of them in the queue. whether or not they bulk, whether or not they walk out of that emergency room before see, being seen depends on the, the length of time they're kept waiting. The state of the system has a big impact on behavior there as well. Now, discrete event simulation has a lot in common with all other dynamic modeling methods, but particularly 
with agent-based models because both are individual level traditions for describing the evolution of a system. They describe the system at a fine grain level, a level of individual. You get the evolution of that system over time. But the focus is different. The focus for agent based modeling is typically on, yes, on the evolution of the agents in a fairly rich way heterogeneous agents, but they're also interacting with each other in a fundamental way. Think about models of infection spread, but think about models of the interaction between individuals in a family suffering domestic violence or, or between users who share needles in a drug, drug use network for intravenous drug use, or, or think about interactions between someone suffering mental health issues in a, in a support dog or something like that. These are all interactions. Agent-based modeling prizes focusing on the interactions between, between agents. Interactions with each other, interactions with the environment. Being influenced by the environment and influencing it back, maybe a geographic space, for example. Um, these are all part and parcel of agent-based modeling. And there's a, a whole set of mechanisms like messages we send from one agent to another by which they interact, for example. But discrete event simulation is a more specialized tradition. Discrete event simulation focuses on progress along defined workflows where, where the progress along a lot of these workflows, the things to, to do or things to be done to undertake, the processes to undertake, that depends on resources that have to be available. So my ability to get care in the emergency room depends on availability of a triage nurse. It depends on availability of, a, uh, while I'm waiting, a seat in the waiting room. And, uh, eventually when I get in order to get admitted to the emergency, I, I, need a, I need a bed to rest in there. And then I need to be seen by a nurse and then by a physician and maybe worked up. Maybe I, you know, maybe I have a, an arm that's just killing me after a fall and they've got to take me for an x-ray and, and they're going to bring me to an x-ray. Or maybe I suffered a concussion and they're going to do an EEG on me and they've got to wheel in that equipment. And whether or not I get discharged back to the community, whether I walk out even before being seen or whether I'm put into the hospital wards to be watched overnight or what have you will depend on the outcomes of these tests, for example. So I'm proceeding along a set of stages, which are well-defined, aren't always linear, but where my progress along that depends on resources. I can't get admitted to the wards without being signed off by a physician. I can't, I can't get, get into a bed unless I've gone through the triage nurse who examines, who takes down what symptoms I'm feeling, takes down a little bit about my specifics, looks at my history, et cetera. So my progress along these workflows depends on, on, um, on the availability of resources. Um, and agents interact, but they interact in one primary way. They interact by keeping each other waiting in queues. Now you can have agent, you can have discrete event simulation models that kind of break that, that try to allow agent entities flowing through the system to interact more fully. But the main forms of interaction are the entities keeping each other waiting, and then resources like physicians or service dogs or whatever interacting with the with the entities. So let's take a look at a model like this. Enough enough discussion. Let's let's go in and take a model. So I'm going to go into the help. Yes, uh, share my screen. Indeed, hasn't been needed till this point, but now is the time. And Larissa's um, right on top of it. Awesome. So appreciate that. Uh, so let's go to the example models and we will see a sort of singularly um, 
limited one. We, we're going to scroll down to something called trauma, trauma center. Okay, there it is. It's in the any logic example models. And it says uh, mumble, uh, reopen it. Yeah, sure. Um, okay, so we're going to take a look at two built in discrete event simulators. Um, <clears throat> I was going to post the third. <clears throat> came out of our work. Um, and we've used this extensively here in Saskatchewan for looking at issues of patient flow, looking at issues of patient flow within facilities and to a degree um, uh, between facilities. Um, this is a tool of art for doing, and we have these sort of models for all six major hospitals in the province. Pasco General Hospital, Regina General Hospital, RUA City Hospital, St. Paul's, et cetera. Um, and there are even some smaller hospitals like out in Calvington where uh, we've done some modeling of this sort or down in Moose Jar or Victoria Hospital. So we've just opened up um, this model and we'll see, you know, something that's presented right in front of us is a visual environment. And this is not really a sketch. It actually has computational components in it. Some of you will notice these paths here with kind of nodes in them. There's a network there, along which it turns out entities will flow as they move around this system. And indeed, much many of the questions that one pursues with a model, model like this is how does not just resource availability, but resource placement uh, affect how efficiently we can deliver care. So let's just focus on workloads, focus on, on sort of defined processes and, and optimizing those processes, making them faster, making them higher quality, more efficient, et cetera, uh, less resource intensive. So we have this sketch and uh, there's going to be entities which flow down either from ambulance or through walk-in here and uh, are going to be circulating through the facility. They'll get seen and eventually they'll get discharged or, or, or be sent to the wards. Um, now, I'd like to, having seen this just a glance, I'd like to look, this is the main environment and inside of that will circulate a set of parties, but there are two basic sorts. The most basic one is the patient. And you'll notice if you double click on the patient, you'll get a rather elemental view of what it means to be a patient. A patient is someone that has a severity of condition, probably a CPAP score, although, or US equivalent. This CPAP would be the Canadian uh, triage acuity scale, one to five. That's what we get classified on every time we go to the ER. And then there's an entry pump, which is a variable, which is indicating when did you come in here? When did you enter the facility? So that's an entity. No state charts, no, no involved sort of rules about how they're evolving. It's more passive. And this, this form of modeling tends to lead to these passive entities compared to agent-based modeling. Agent-based modeling would be autonomous agent to drive around the or interact with their deer, see other deer and they run towards them or away from them or whatever. They they are they you have devils in the devil facial tumor disease model who who bite other devils and get infected and develop cancer and progress. And this sort of modeling <clears throat> the entities are agents at a technical level here. But they kind of flow through the system. They're kind of operated upon by the system, much as in a hospital you might be wheeled from one room to the other. In a in a gurney, you might be placed in an X-ray machine. You might be taken for an ultrasound. You might be placed in a ward or what have you, administered pharmaceuticals. But beyond patients, there's a, another whole type of set of parties to them. That are of a totally different sort. These are called resources. And they come in various forms doctors, nurses, physicians, assistants, registrar, specialists, technicians, and transport related ones. Um, 
And each of these has a certain minimal logic to itself. It has a, at least a, uh, a presentation um, and that allows it to, to circulate as a separate party. Even here, these are fairly simple, but they're in different groups because they're needed at different places within the system. And yet, I've shown you some visual representation. I've shown you some of these, these parties, which are still associated with minimal components, but I haven't gotten to the, the heart of the logic behind this. And if you go to this, um, to Maine, and you were to scroll down, there you'll start to see something that's more at the heart of the map. This is a process centric form of model, a workflow centric form of model. It has steps associated with it. And so here, you know, your arrivals, and depending on whether you came in via walk in or ambulance, you get different treatment. So I scrolled down in Maine below the uh, below the uh, map here. There we go. You can see that. And and then with walk-in, uh, they, they'll go on to triage and a set of steps. After an ambulance entry, they'll be triaged as well to make get a fast track down for certain types of needs or or go into a more slow uh, uh, slow form of triage for um, for more conventional needs. Um, uh, here, um, here we have bedside registration by EMS, perhaps for very very serious uh, patients from an ambulance, etc. So these are workflows. These are associated with the steps someone has to go through. And notice my words there. The entities flow through this. They they are routed through these things, and each of these steps indicated by these blocks, and we'll learn what sort of blocks they are. They'll typically need resources to proceed. So, for example, if they are going to be examined uh, by an x ray, they're going to need a spot in the x ray. They're going to need to be slotted in to an x ray schedule. Right? They have to be arranged for them to go through the x-ray. So they'll be the third one in line or whatever, and eventually it comes to the law. They also may need, prior to that, examination by a physician's assistant, for example. Um, and uh, there's other, other situations where they may be under treatment, for example, by a physician's assistant or require a specialist, et cetera. So, so here, in general, there's going to be certain resources needed. Even getting admitted, you need the triage nurse to give you time of day to take your health card and let you in. And a system like this can map this out. This is a different language. It's a different language than stocks and flows. It's a different language than state charts. It's a language for describing resource limited workflows. In other words, there's a workflow, you have to go through a set of steps, but they are resource limited. You have to, you wait for a while until resources are available. And what sort of resources, what are the sort of resources for which you wait? Doctors, nurses, PAs, uh, registrars, specialists, tech, and, and transport. This is the sorts of resources. Okay, so a lot of the attention in this sort of modeling is in fact on those resources. Um, and you're interested in, you know, how does the, how do the patterns of length of stay, for example, or utilization of resources at the different rooms that are available, the staff, these different types of staff, how do those vary as you change? We have more physicians, maybe having more physicians will let people be seen quicker and proceed quicker, but maybe they're not the bottleneck, right? Maybe sometimes they're not the one who's the critical shortage. Maybe there's enough physicians, but not enough nurses. And nurses indeed are under, undervalued often in our system. Or maybe the shortage is actually one of rooms. 
So you have enough physicians and you have enough nurses, but we just don't have enough rooms to give you know, timely examination for our patients and we're kept waiting for the room. This sort of modeling can help you reason through all of that and ask what if questions about resources. Okay, so, so let's, this is a, a model, but it's a precise enough model to be a simulatable model to say, well, okay, what gives? I mean, like, go figure, like, okay, if this is the situation, what's the result? Well, there's a simulation here and we can go run it. So let's go right click on this and we will see this trauma center come to life. Okay, um, we'll see it enacted. So you'll notice that here it's depicted in a, in a 3D view. There's actually a, a little camera um, that was positioned. Some of you may have seen the, the icon here, a camera position to kind of view the, the scene here. And you can see people coming in um, from ambulance or through walk-in here. You can see them being paired up with individuals and brought to rooms to be examined. Some people are in gurneys and uh, others are being uh, are, are coming in through, through walking in. There are some areas where some of the staff are congregating, et cetera. And we see in general movement around in a coordinated fashion. And a model like this captures that coordination. You reserve for the patient, you reserve a nurse to bring them to a room perhaps and, and do a workup on them, examine them physically. And, and that nurse goes with the patient to that room. The room is reserved for that patient. They're going to that one versus another one because they preserved it. And so it is with this sort of model. Um, this is at an individual level. It may remind you a little bit of Asian based modeling because it is in an individual model. And indeed, everything here can be done in Asian based modeling. But the language is different. And as computer scientists, ladies and gentlemen, we have a, we're in a fortunate position. When we choose the problems to work on, we can choose languages that are best suited to those problems. And different of these modeling approaches will be suitable for different types of questions. If your questions are about resourcing, resource placement or resource availability and how that would help the situation, if it's about workflows that, that are resource limited and in some sort of structured way, um, a set of fairly well-defined processes where the interaction is not so much between patients, but between patients and what resources are available. This can spare you massive amounts of work compared to implementing this in agent-based model. You could do it, of course. I mean, you, this is computationally universal. Agent-based modeling is computationally universal. Um, you could, anything you can do in agent-based modeling by weird twisting you can do in this and vice versa. But this framework is, is particularly elegant, concise, crisp for describing certain types of problems involving, involving these resource limited workflows and um, in resource pools um, that, that can be reasoned about as we change them. Okay. so. Here we have uh, a, a model that is composed of a set of pieces. Some of these are familiar, some are less familiar, like arrival rate tables, for example, or these resources here that are phrased. And in general, um, that, that, special, that indicate, you know, how many physicians do we have? Where's their, what speed at which do they move? Um, you know, what's their home location, for example, to which they, go when they're not busy, the doctor's room, or the nurse's room, or the nurses and techs location, et cetera. And these are all tied in with that visual representation. So it's a sort of a visual language associated with movement around the facilities. And there's a set of, of parameters here and some tables that, that can be looked up as well. So, this is one model in this tradition. There, there's others. I'd like to open up the emergency department model as well. 
So um, the trauma center, you could close that for now. And we'll open up a model that's a little bit a uh, little bit simpler to deal with, perhaps. Uh, and that is emergency department. Okay. Um, emergency department also lists a uh, a situation where we have healthcare delivery, but it's in a simpler network here. Um, so we have uh, nurses and physicians who have lounges and a kind of waiting area for patients. And then we have a set of examination rooms and we have this network by which people are routed between these different places. We have x-rays that are used in some cases in ultrasound locations, et cetera. And once again, our interest is in how long people are staying, for example, um, or what level of resource utilization is there. Are nurses busy almost all the time, but physicians maybe only half the time? Um, or is it the rooms that are sometimes lying idle that can help us identify these resource imbalances? Which is exactly the sort of thing that can give, or give insight as to kind of optimizing uh, the process. So let's run this. Um, this should start to look a little bit familiar. Um, and the questions that would be asked about this will also be familiar. Okay, um, so once again, we have this uh, 3D view. We can also do a 2D overhead view if you want. I clicked on it up here. But in this case, you could easily see the logic as well. And once again, we'll see this, this logic of this workflow. Um, in this case, almost, almost linear uh, in a layout sense, um, in a sense of kind of one thing leading to the next. But we have an ultrasound process and an X ray process um, that, that has some branches. Um, these are the building blocks, and we're going to describe these building blocks. Some involve cubes, that's that little kind of icon here. Um, some involve sending people to certain places, like the triage room or the emergency care room. Um, some involve waiting, say, for registration process to be, uh, to be completed. And you'll notice that these numbers associated with this are rising over time. This indicates the number that have come in and the numbers that, that have left there, for example. Um, this is a timing annotation to say, hey, I'd like to time, to measure the time between when people came in and when they ended here. And here you can see the utilization associated with these different resources, the triage rooms, the emergency care rooms, the nurses, the physician's assistants, the techs, et cetera. Okay, so another example of these sorts of models, this one a little bit more bite-sized, okay? Um, integrated with all of this is a physical movement. So like go, go to triage room might bring someone within the 3D view to a, uh, a triage room by which they're, they're examined for uh, uh, one of these two triage rooms, et cetera. And by playing this out over time, you can start to get a sense of the dynamics that are induced. Take a look at this length of stay, for example. What this is indicating is that most people wait a small amount of time, but there's some need here uh, that's about a little bit over an hour, but some people are staying here well over three hours. This long tail indicating how long it takes to get to get seen. I think for a lot of uh, a lot of those new to simulation, a lot of students who are just learning about this, this sort of model will make some sense. I mean, it works for a lot of persons, whether it's a physically waiting the line or whether it's applying for permanent residency or, or applying for graduate school or going through a process of, of you know, getting a, a license to drive, the steps you go through that are defined. They take time. You have to go, you have to have resources like, you know, get a driving test to get you from the learner's license to the full driver's license, et cetera. And, and uh, description mechanisms like this allow you to capture it with minimal fuss, 
minimal months. Um, it's, it's quite straightforward. Okay, so let's dive into this language. It's a more specialized language in system dynamics. It's a more specialized language than agent based models. But when it is the right language, when it's a good fit for that area of your model or that process you're, you're considering, um, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very effective language. So let's, let's talk about it. Okay, so um, discrete event modeling. Uh, as I said, it's about resource limited progress for the final. Okay. Um, we have flow charts and we have processes in them through which these entities, and they're called entities, it's a term of art, they flow predominantly passively. These patients are operated upon by these processes. They're taken to the x ray machine. They're delivered, administered this drug or whatever. There's cues when resources are not available. The primary thing that happens when a resource is not available is that people wait in queue, the entities wait in queue for that resource. The resource uh, is not yet ready. People will queue up and await it. So when it's ready, they'll be taken. Um, and sometimes more than one resource um, will have for each resource some capacitated pools. It's a fancy way to say we have pools of interchangeable resources. That's important. The resources are considered interchangeable here. So if you're being seen by physician, uh, you know, Jones versus by physician Smith versus by physician, you know, uh, uh, Samuel. You know, these are these are uh, all considered commodities represented by physicians. Here. Um, and in fact, uh, I don't see a physician one in this particular diagram, but um, in the other one, there's a physician pool, and here. They would all be viewed as kind of interchangeable. That's that's actually uh, something that's fairly tightly captured. So you have these resource pools, much as in system dynamics, you have a stock of more or less interchangeable things. Um, and in those resource pools, you'll draw on those resources over time. Um, so continuing on with that. Um, I'm not sure why this is, come on, um, get out of here. Okay, I didn't want that, come on. Um, uh, so entities, once the resource is available, they be allocated it. And the term of art is, and it's a bit transgressive, the entity seizes that resource, okay? So the entity, seizes a resource, meaning it's allocated to them. It's reserved by them. It may be a room. It may be an EEG machine. It may be a bed. It may be a wheelchair. Um, it could be a physician's assistant. But we say that the entity seizes the resource. That is the term of art for it. And then they'll release the resource at the end of that, at that time period. There's typically spatial mobility, uh, mobility by some of the entities. You know, they're routed to the emergency care room or the trauma room or the x-ray machine. And mobility sometimes by resources. And there'll be three types of resources as it affects mobility. One of them is mobile resources, like physicians and, and nurses and technicians and so on that can move around actively on their own. And then there'll be attachment of resources to entities so that they move with the entity. So you, we say we attach a wheelchair to this entity, meaning wherever the wheelchair goes, wherever the, entity, the person goes, the patient goes, the wheelchair. The journey will follow the patient. The 
the EEG, the portable ultrasound will go with the, uh, with the patient or what have you. Okay, so flow charts are specifying a process, it's a workflow. Entities flow through these processes and they're required for proceeding at certain points. Um, and entities interact with these resources, they seize them and release them. And they are attached to them and they detach them. The attached is do they move with the entity or are they just kind of free floating and they don't they don't move to anyone? And well, a physical home for resources like the nurses hang out at the nurses lounge and the physicians have a physician's area and there'll be movement paths here. Okay. Um, we've seen those as that connected uh, networks. Okay. So There'll be these service networks, which are going to group entities, um, work resources, and workflows. Um, so here we're going to have a flowchart, which is going to be associated with, with types of resources available to it, and with uh, a source and with a sink, or where people come in and where they leave. And it'll be associated with a, a physical space. So. This is actually a picture taken an older version of network, and and there used to be this symbol that would explicitly group them, and that's that's no longer um, put in place here. Um, it's it's no longer something which which you'll see in the modern versions, if I'm aware. Okay, so entities are these agents operated upon by the process, and again, you have to be very careful here to distinguish. <laughs> Two types of basic actors. There's the actors that flow through the process. They're acted upon by this workflow. And then there are these other actors, physicians, nurses, technicians, physicians assistants, um, ambulance drivers, whatever, that act upon them. Those are the resources. And there's this kind of fundamental dichotomy between those two. You don't really see that in agent anymore, right? There's just different types of agents. There are devil agents, and there's field worker agents, or there's service dogs, and, and they're owners, or they're, they're caregivers, or what have you. But here, you have this fundamental distinction, a dichotomy between the things operated upon these entities and the, the resources used to interact with them. In that model we have uh, of COVID-19, um, which Leah is working on these days, um, which came out of her lab, um, you have this sort of discrete medicine like, a lot. And while people are in a hospital, the you know the physicians are acting as resources. The nurses are acting as resources. But then they go home for the night as agents, they can get sick. And if they catch infection in the hospital, they can bring it to their family. That'll be a hybrid model. We can go into that next. But here, basically, while they're in this workflow, you know, they're one of these two types. And it's a pretty, pretty dramatic distinction between them. So the first of those two types is entities. Those are the parties on which the on which this operates. Those are the ones who are going through this system in the emergency department. There we go. Um, in who are flowing through this. So if we run this, you'll see these ones coming in and going to the waiting room, for example. Uh, they are flowing through this system. So here are the nurses uh, and the physician's assistants. Who are, who are ready to serve them. And here's a patient being seen, for example, um, and uh, here's being delivered care, et cetera. And you'll notice these people transiently in the waiting room. I believe they are clothed in black um, for no obvious good reason, uh, except to distinguish them. Um, those folks that, that are coming in here, these are the entities. And it's them that are going to, sorry for the lapse of English, that are going to flow through the workflow down here. It's these entities that are flowing through here. Okay. Um, 
Okay, um, so let's let's hop back to the slides here. So the entities are treated predominantly passively. Things happen to them. The processes operate upon them. They flow through the system. They are injected into the system at a source and they disappear at the sink. Um, they only exist for this length of time that they're in the system. Very different view than atom-based modeling and system dynamics modeling. Um, in system dynamics model, yes, you have flow out, flows out of the system, right? Um, you can have a, a depth flow, and in a great model, you can have that kind of death star, which kind of represents death and where the edge disappears. But here, it's a routine part that these entities kind of are transient. They come in, they stay there, you measure them while they're there, and then they leave because our focus is on work. Focus of what happens to them while they're in this workflow. If you want to keep track of their whole life cycle, what they're doing in the community, what they're doing out there beyond the, the hospital, outside the hospital, so on, you should be thinking um, hybrid model. Um, so multiple entities are picked within the system as a time. They're queued up often, waiting for each other, et cetera. Just like in the hospital, it's, it's you know, delivering care to, to many people at once. Um, and uh, often these entities are associated with a, a physical representation. So we have entities, and on the flip side, we have resources. This is the dichotomy. Both have actors involved. Both can have mobile agents of sorts, but there are two different roles. One, having service delivered to them. The other, delivering that care service. Um, so, what about these resources? Well, resources are the key for entities to be able to receive, right? Um, uh, so these could be doctors, pieces of diagnosis equipment, uh, you know, a better wheelchair, um, something that's portable or something that's fixed, like an x-ray machine, you know, an x-ray room or a, an MRI or what have you. Uh, and there's, there's a big distinction between, on the one hand, mobile such resources, physicians, physicians assistants, nurses, service dogs, whatever, whatever it is that, that's a resource in your, in your sphere. But then there are some with no agency that are not mobile. Um, and those come in two basic forms. Fixed ones. These are static, they don't move. Your MRI machine, your X-ray machine, you know, in a, in a room, not a portable one, but a, a larger scale one, a CAT scan machine, um, a room. Um, these are fixed resources. It can be a resource, right? We need, to admit you, you need a bed. It's a fixed resource. You need a room to be examined in your urgent care center. Fixed resource. The other one, it could be portable. So maybe it's a portable ultrasound and I can bring it around and the ultrasound technician carries it with them to the patient room or the patient is traveling with a portable resource like a, a wheelchair. And that will go with the patient, but it won't go on its own. It, it doesn't have mobility on its own. It depends on some other actors. Um, so generally a network has multiple, multiple types of resources. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, uh, be nice to, to be able to explore this a little bit. Um, for example, if we were to go in, in this emergency department model, and we were to click on a nurse here and take a look at the properties for the nurse. And I'm gonna rearrange this to give us a bit more room. Here we're gonna go, so it's in Maine, nurse here. And what we'll see is this is a resource type moving. Nurses have agency, they can move around, they're mobile, right? Um, and uh, there's a certain number of them a count of nurses that unfortunately is called nurses. Um, 
Uh, but uh, there are instances of this nurse agent and, and, and any logic. Uh, by contrast, something like a EC room is a static resource. It's a fixed resource. It's not going to move. Um, something like an ultrasound here will be portable, so it can be it can be moved around. Um, uh, whereas something like an X-ray machine is is fixed. So we have these these different resources, and they have they have capacity. So there's only one X-ray machine, for example. Um, so we can lay out what these resources are and the type of resource they are, the, the associated agent, and whether it's it's fixed, in other words, static, portable, or mobile. Um, any, any questions about this notion of resource and entity before we start going into issues of, of flow? Any questions about that? Yes. 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 So both. So this is an implementation aspect of any um, any logic uh, is one of those very few frameworks that supports meaningful discrete event simulation alongside. Interface model. And the way in which they support discrete event simulation is to kind of build it atop this notion of an agent. And so here, entities happen to be agents, resources happen to be, uh, be agents, but how they function, the roles that they take on are different. They're both implemented as agents, but they, they play very different roles in this human theater of service delivery. One delivers services for the other. But you're absolutely right. right. They're both actually implemented here as agents. But it would be a mistake to say, oh, well, they're implemented as agents, so it's an agent-based model. No, no, no. Agent modeling, it's defined by something more than just a model that uses agents. The language which we use to build it up and the questions that are asked as well. Here, there's a very specialized language, this language of workflows, which isn't a language of agent based modeling, but instead of discrete events. As we'll soon see, though, the world of, of dynamic modeling changes. And in my generation, there was different practitioners, very rarely were the practitioners now more than one. You have a specialist in discrete math simulation, and that specialist would know anything about agent based modeling, and they would know anything about this dynamic modeling. Or you have someone in this dynamic model that's never seen any discrete math simulation models before, it knows nothing about it, but they know it's this dynamic model. And that's still true for most of my older colleagues, but times have changed. And partly due to our work here, People have realized that um, that actually there's enormous value by figuring out how these play together nicely and work together. And it turns out that they're going to work together very really effectively. And any logic early on um, saw this elements of this vision and worked to support it in a more seamless way. And one way they did that was by trying to build discrete event simulation in a way that's compatible with with agent based modeling and this is key because it's not really a historic it's not merely a historic asset nor is it a chance implementation feature that both resources and entities are, are agents because it does allow exactly what i said earlier like our model for COVID 19 used for planning day-to-day -day here in the province used extensively for planning in Yukon, used extensively for planning in Australia capital territories, currently being adapted for Alberta. This model takes advantage of that because both are entities and both go home at night to their family, both interact in the community, get bug in front of the community, whether they're a resource, a doctor, 
is how they're, you know, whether they come in as a doctor to the hospital, whether they come in as a patient, they can bring in COVID or bring it home, right? And that's an advantage. And if you capture them both as agents, then you can capture that fundamental commonality. They still play different roles in the hospital. Doctors play the doctor's roles. The the patients play the, the patient's role. But both at the end of the day are also agents in the community. So anyway, uh, we'll be hearing about hybrid models soon enough. So we have these flow charts and these flow charts are central and they're gonna consist of a number of pieces, okay? So broadly, as Lewis Carroll said, and Alice in Wonderland, start at the beginning, let them down. So you typically have some start, you have some workflow, and then you have a sink or you have a finish. Now, I exaggerated or I overstated a little bit because commonly there are loops here. You can actually get loops around where agents stay in here for a prolonged time. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing improper about it. Um, you may get someone who's in the VA system, the veterans administration system for a long time. Maybe they're a veteran. Um, and uh, for the rest of their life, they are circulated within that system in terms of veterans benefits, et cetera. Or maybe they are someone who has, um, has been involved in immigration processes and they're involved in the immigration system on an ongoing basis. Um, or the tax system or what have you. So you can have persistence in here or at least define workflows, but commonly you have a mechanism of coming in and leaving one or the other. Um, and in the meantime, you have a set of, of workflows. And a couple things need to be emphasized. One, I said is these are not, often these are not linear. They're not strictly one thing leads the next, leads the next, leads the next, and with no chance for anything else. It's actually have branches. And reflecting branches, they have joins, places where it joins together. You can have a confluence, you know, no matter who someone was seen by, whether they were seen by a physician or, a, or a nurse practitioner for their appointment, after that, they are, you know, seen by a, a nurse and then discharged. Whatever. So you have these drawings. Um, and importantly, you can have hierarchy. You can have you can have uh, areas of the model which are nested inside of others. So you can have, for example, a CAT scan process that has its own definition. This is actually very significant. Um, the fact that you can hierarchically build up these models. There's, there, it turns out to be really important conceptually, but it allows for a certain modularity, allows for a certain you know, uh, separation of concern. So you, you have a CAT scan layer that focuses on the details of that. You can slot it into this bigger process. And you'll notice there's quite a few of these, the ultrasound process, the view Q scan process, et cetera. Um, Okay, now within this, uh, we'll make use of the process modeling template. So if you go to the palette here, down here, you'll find that there's a whole lot of other ways of describing systems. Um, and one of them, this one at the top, is the process modeling language, uh, provides primitives in the process modeling languages. Sources, sinks, delays, queues, things to route people around, to combine things, um, to seize resources, to release those resources, uh, et cetera. Um, some of them actually involve things to, for resources to undertake subtasks, et cetera, you know, to, to undertake the tax, uh, ta uh, certain types of uh, tasks before they see a patient, maybe washing their hands or donning protective gear or what have you. Um, and some of these involve more specialized things that often come up in industrial settings, so like batching or unbatching, um, can be can be very useful in, in process uh, settings in, in industry. 
And you notice this time measure start, time measure uh, end here. Um, okay, so let's let's talk about uh, these components. The major operators here. So these are these are workflows, and they have operators associated with it. These components here of the workflow. You can think of them as operators. There are things that operate upon the end. They're these building blocks. What building blocks are they? What are the building blocks? Well, let's talk about some of the most important ones. You can find more here that I won't dwell on. Um, so one thing is, and again, I don't know why this is coming up. Uh, okay, fine. Um, out of black spot. Um, great. Um, Okay, so let's talk about source uh, first. Uh, you can have sources that reflect arrival rates, for example, of agents, um, or inter-arrival times of agents. You can use sources to describe a number of different ways agents can arrive and, and different mathematical formalisms. Just like you can have different transition types, you can have different source types. Um, so if I were to drag a source over here, or if I were to just look at this source, um, you'll notice that I can state it as a rate. Oh, oh my gosh. Okay, well, ain't that a surprise. Um, so that was a, a bug. Um, okay, uh, but you can describe it as rate, inter-arrival times, you can have people um, be injected uh, into it externally uh, by other processes. Uh, and uh, there's, I think, one or, one or two at least uh, additional methods by which they can come into uh, the workflow here. Um, sinks uh, allow people or entities to disappear within the workflow. Uh, entities can also, okay, here, uh, sorry, I just want to get that so I can show you, okay, let's close that, so let's go do this again. Um, you can also enter and leave particular networks, so this would be a situation where we have a couple different networks associated with different resources. And I want to uh, enter and leave those different resources uh, or those different different networks, which have kind of different physical spaces, different resources. So maybe it's emergency room versus the wards of the hospital or something like that. Um, I had wanted to show you some of these additional components uh, of of their uh, of their ability to have them come in. So here, arrival table, a database, a schedule. And you can also importantly say, inject this person externally. Um, it turns out that there's another mechanism we'll use in hybrid modeling to say that they enter. And we can say like, make this agent enter this workflow. Another advantage of having it implemented as, as kind of agents. Um, so, this entering and exit uh, allow to place someone into the workflow and we'll be making heavy use of that uh, down the road um, with, uh, with hybrid model. Um, in some versions of any logic, I think the latest one as well, you can specify when do I enter a network and when do I leave a network, where a network again, concerns a workflow and a set of resources associated with it and often a physical environment too. Um, you can select outputs. Now selecting outputs basically allows split and it can be based on a probabilistic split um, or based on a condition. So we can say, if this condition is true, they go this way, otherwise that way. Here it's labeled true, false. Or we can do it probabilistically, like with a certain chance they go one way or the other. Um, here, for example, it's just a probability of 
but we could say condition true and we could say well if the patient has such and such a condition then they go one way versus then they go the other way um so a delay is one of the most foundational components and here we're basically saying look there's some process that takes a certain amount of time it doesn't require extra resources beyond what was reserved already before it um if you're here it just takes a amount of time for a physician to examine or it requires a certain amount of time for you for the x-ray to be performed on or a certain amount of time for you to have the checkup um, checkup performed by a, a nurse practitioner or what have you. So here we have a delay time that's drawn from a distribution um, that reflects how long they spend. Um, so in general, though, you'll notice these ones I've been talking about don't explicitly depend on resources. These are all about patient progress through this workflow, or they go this way or that way, how long they wait here, um, when they come in, et cetera. And that's all good. But the, the more interesting ones are ones that depend on resources. Receive the entity needs a resource, maybe more than one resource. And so here we're going to be dealing with these, these mechanisms to allow us to seize a resource. But if the resource is not available, they will wait for it. They will simply be waiting for availability of that resource. It's like waiting for the expert. You're sort of line. There's two people ahead of you. There's one person right now, maybe, and you wait for it. So along with this need for resource comes with the need to wait. And that's what the cues uh, are okay? So basically you're queuing up until this resource is available. Um, think about you waiting for a taxi or an Uber or what have you. Um, you're you're waiting, waiting in line, whether it's a physical line or a conceptual line. Um, and, uh, the resources that you're going to be grabbing are the ones in those pools. Um, you'll want to seize a resource from the pool. If there's none available, you'll wait. Um, and uh, if there's two types of resources, you need different sorts, you can put them in different pools. Um, so here we're going to have a, a seize block, a release block, and they'll be dealing with pools. So let's go see how that works. Um, so here we have a workflow, and you'll notice there's this thing that says seize triage room. And seize triage room is a seize, a seize that operator. Seize the resource. Grab which resources are grabbed that are listed here are the resource set. So it's gonna it's going to need one triage room and one nurse as well. Those resources are needed by it in order to proceed. Uh, and you'll notice that there's this question of the policy. Do you seize them one at a time as they become available or the whole set at once? You just, you know, you have to seize them atomically all together. And can anyone say what might go wrong if you seize them one by one? Some of you may have taken 353, or you may have taken uh, another course, perhaps in concurrent programming, if you're a fourth year student. Um, what could go wrong if you seize the resources one by one, if you're not careful? Yes, the reason. You may release one before you're done with it. Okay. Okay, you're you're getting the right idea. You might might be some issue on on releasing them. So if you seize them one by one, you're you're warm in your idea. Um there's a little bit more to it though. I think you go terribly wrong. Yes. 
Yes. That's right. So maybe I need resource A and B, and I grab A. I've got A. Um, and now I'm waiting for B, but I'm, I'm holding A, and A is unavailable for others, right? But something even worse can come to it than that. What else can happen? What what bad thing could end up happening? Theresa. Deadlock is exactly right. It's exactly right. So what could happen? Exactly. And neither of you can proceed, right? I'm I I've got A, but I, I need B to proceed, and I can't proceed without B. Someone else is B, they need A and they can't proceed. Neither of us can proceed, and therefore we're stuck in perpetuity holding these 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 resources and preventing them from being used. Absolutely not something you want, right? Um Kind of like the equivalent of gridlock on a city street. You've got cars can't go this way, forward this way or forward that way, and they're just stuck, right? Um, deadlock is a very real issue, and you have to be very careful if you're going to seize them one by one. You always want to list them in the same order because if there's another place in the model which lists them in an opposite order, you know, if you're seizing them one by one. And in this place, you have triage rooms and a nurse, and somewhere else is nurse and a triage room, then you could have exactly the deadlock situation. As long as they're in the same order everywhere, you never have them on order, you can actually avoid deadlock. But but it's uh, if you if you're inconsistent about the ordering, you can get in a situation where deadlock occurs. Yeah. So here's the situation where you know, we could, we have to be careful when we have multiple resources. Um, but here, you're going to need to seize those resources before you can proceed. And if they're not available, if even one of them is not available, then you queue up. And that's that little kind of, kind of odd looking little lattice at the beginning of this. You, you queue up. Um, and um, here, you're just awaiting availability. Uh, when that resource is available, it's served to the people in the queue one by one. Um, so in other words, the first person is, who is waiting for it gets it, they go forward, and then you know, the next and that person, the next person in the queue has to wait for the next uh, next availability of these things, et cetera. So where you have resource needs, you have queues. And you notice in this said. Uh, in this case, it says you have a maximum capacity. You can also set a maximum. And if it goes over that, it'll be unhappy and it will blow up. It'll say like two size overflow or whatever. Like uh, basically that's a sign that, you know, bad things are happening. Um, okay, so the major things to know here are seizing and releasing. Now, again, those terms, not transgressive, but they're not meant to be. But they think of reserving resources, right? Um, it may be you seize the room in the sense that it's reserved for you. You're going to be placed in that room for examination for the next half hour with your physician. Or maybe you, you know, seized a an X-ray machine. It's reserved for you for this time slot. And then you release it and it's unallocated. Now, I want to distinguish that, and I'm emphasizing this terminology from a situation of attaching. Attaching is, again, I am physically affiliated with this thing, so it travels with me. Okay? Seizing and releasing from that reservation, they're about allocation of resources. Attaching and detaching. Or about physical co presence moving with you. Um, and this will become relevant when we deal with agent movement. And indeed, that's exactly what we have in this operator the move to operator. And there'll be a resource send to operator. I, I spoke earlier before of three types of resources. Does anyone remember those three types? 
three parts. What were they? You had mobile was one. Excellent. Fix was another one. Portable, Portable was the third. Good. What type? If you said resource send to, what do you think that makes sense for? The same basically, this resource needs to go over there. That'd be for. So it's predominantly into mobile resources. In order for it to be portable, to, it would have to be brought there by another entity or resource. But but resource send to be for a. a, a, a uh, a resource with agency. It can move itself to go there. Move to is for the entity. And this is something that students find sometimes confusing about this. Like move to is something you apply to entities. Resource sent to is something for resources. Okay. Um, okay. So I want to distinguish between seizing and seizing and releasing. That's about allocation. It's about reservation of this thing, regardless of whether they're physically together or not. I can be very far from that room right now, but it's reserved for me. I'm going to be brought there. Attaching and detaching is whether it, whether they spatially follow it. Okay. Um, uh, okay. Um, so, you know, here, uh, for example, you'll find go to triage room. And here, this moves. The agent to in space, it kind of moves them slowly in space to the C in a continuous fashion to the seized resource unit. What do you think that means? Move them to the seized resource unit. Exactly, exactly. So this person sees the triage room here, and that's what we looked at earlier. And and now they're they're going to that triage room with which that has been reserved for them, right? Um, and in fact, it says which resource, you know, it, its destination is the seized resource of this sort, triage room. Um, and uh, they move there in a continuous fashion. Um, and it's defined by a distance or speed, you know, as dictated by that agent in the pool. So, for example, nurses move with a certain speed, and physicians move with a certain speed, uh, et cetera. Uh, the triage room doesn't move with, with speed, but physicians assistants move with speed. Okay, um, so this is an example of kind of movement to there. This is a this is a uh, delay. Um, so. You know, this operation will take between five and 15 minutes, for example, um, et cetera. So here we have a mechanism of associated with, um, with moving people around, releasing them, um, seizing resources, et cetera. And then eventually they will leave. Uh, they'll leave the facility. Um, okay, so resource sent to i didn't i didn't have an example right in in this particular workflow but here you're sending a resource um a certain resource uh to a certain destination such as uh the the scope resource that's been reserved for it so you might send the doctor to wherever the EEG is for them to go get the EEG that has been reserved uh, for this uh, for this patient, for example, uh, with which they have been who had seized them. Um, okay, um, and you can you can send resource send to can can send particular resources to the entity. So here. You can send a resource to the entity, or you can send it to another resource seized by that entity that has seized me. So I'm a physician. I've been seized by a patient. I've been allocated to that patient, reserved by a patient. And I have to go get the type of scope that's needed by that patient and has been reserved for them. Boom. And I can do that, or I can move directly to the entity. 
or I can move to a certain node, for example. Um, okay, um, right. Um, yeah, and so you can move uh, also entities to certain destinations. Uh, detaching is quite simple. That's the opposite of seizing. That's basically the agent is uh, letting go of, uh, of an allocation. It's deallocating it. It is releasing it from, it's no longer reserved for that entity. Um, okay, um, right. So entities here are associated with icons, resources are associated with locations and icons and movement networks uh, route around. And generally, if I wanna go from A to B, I'm routed via the shortest path as I believe the, the algorithm that's used. Okay, I'm not gonna go into this, but there's a specific layout mechanism within any logic for drawing these paths. Um, and that allows us to, to build them up with any, any logic with what is called markup language. Um, and so that markup language is called space markup. And you can basically delineate paths, rooms, nodes, attractors, which basically will attract say the entities to stand in that area or what have you, and you have paths. I think this is all we have time for today uh, for discrete event simulation, but I'll remind you, discrete event simulation is a tool for describing resource limited workflows. That is workflows where entities slow down this workflow and their ability to proceed down the workflow depends on their delivery. And the types of models for which we use this are modeling where you're often very interested in how to optimize the workflow, how to optimize the service delivery, the ability to, to process things quickly. We're interested in throughput, how many agents we can process per day, think patients, their latency, how long they're staying there, their length of stay, how long the waiting lists are. And we're interested in understanding how does that change if we have more resources of a certain type or less, or if we place those resources at certain locations in a more artful manner. We're seeing lots of flowcharts, you have queues where resources are not available. Those, those pools of resources are for defined size, and entities seize that is, have allocated to them resources and release them. And where resources are not available, there are queues. Entities move around in space, and so do resources. And uh, entities can attach to resources and move with them within space. And we have this defined way of building up a visual depiction. So that's all we're going to discuss right now for the street event simulation. But it will play a major role in the next little bit, namely. I'm going to be discussing hybrid modeling. And hybrid modeling is going to have a big role. Uh, it's going to have a prominent, um, a prominent place for discrete event simulation, particularly as it's used with agent-based models. And so that's what we're going to be exploring later this week. Yes, Kenneth. Yes. Uh, so I didn't end up requiring it for today, but it's going to be something that we'll probably be talking about some next week. So it's actually not critical that it be done by today, but it is important that it be done within within uh, by next Tuesday, particularly a week from today. Okay, we're not going to be leaning on it on Thursday, but next week I may be hitting some material that draws on that. And I want you to know about them because I want to be able to talk. To Okay. okay, so that's all we have time for today. I'm glad to hold office hours and as normal, I'll, I'll hold them here, but remotely and um, we can uh, engage in person if, if people are here, but at a distance. Thank you.